Well, fasten your seat belts. Amen. Be, be, be prepared to be challenged because I'm going to challenge you with the Word of God tonight. And um, I had to go against many people's uh, popular opinion. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to be controversial. I just simply want to be versial and uh, go verse by verse, okay? And uh, to say it and to understand it the way that the Lord's revealed it to us. The book of Revelation has a seal upon the New Testament, just as though, just like Deuteronomy, God put a seal upon the Torah, the law of Moses, as it came down from Sinai. And uh, he said, don't add to it, don't take away from it. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we know that the book of Revelation, not many, many theologians, uh, well, scholars and people who were trying to discredit uh, certain parts of the Bible and really all under the skies of crediting what part of the Bible should belong, what should be done away with, what's really part of what we call the autograph. And that means the original manuscript that John would have put together or that the church would have put together in the first century and, and what, versus what we have today. And no amount, no amount of effort has been able to in any way do away with the most challenging writings in the New Testament, and those are the writings of John, the Apostle John. He was radical. That's why they tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't boil. That's why they tried to... Uh, Isolate him on the Isle of Patmos, and I guarantee you he didn't die there, okay? Because if he had died there, I mean, goodness gracious, how would the rest of this stuff, you know, have been transferred, and how would he have been the one to compile it at the end, according to the tradition of the church, which I believe is true. I believe it's a true word that John's the one who <clears throat> the Lord used to put everything together, put the final amen on it. And he put the final amen on the book of Revelation, and he got to the church. And so I'm sure it wasn't, they didn't come out and visit him on Patmos, and it was just laying on his head as a document. And they said, oh, here it is. <coughs> but at any rate, <coughs> book of Revelation said, don't add to this book, because if you add to it, the plagues of this book should be added to you. Anybody who, in, anybody who gets the plagues of this book has got them a serious problem. Anybody who is involved during the times that the tribulation goes, takes place is going to get the plagues. There's only one company of people that will not be subject to the plagues, and I'm going to talk about three companies of saints that are revealed in the first part of the book. And, and I, I want to emphasize the chronology of this book. And I also want to say, uh, as I was previously speaking, those who take away from this book, <laughs> it's grievous, uh, your name should be taken out of the book of life. Wow, you don't want that. And some people say, well, my goodness, that's intense. I, I really believe that when you add to it and that when you take away from it, basically you open up yourself for deception. And it's that deception that ultimately disqualifies you. It takes you down a, a road that ultimately leads you to destruction. So we want to get it right. We just want to say it just like you said. As people say, book of Revelation, hard. It's really not hard. It's really not. It's, it's pretty simple. In fact, John is a chronologer. And I don't want to say this, and I can't say it too much. If it wasn't for the Gospel of John, we wouldn't know that Jesus' ministry was any more than about a year. John really sets things into position for us and helps us to understand because of the way he creates chronology that the Jesus' ministry was about three and a half years because he shows us Passovers and he shows us Feast of Tabernacles and he shows us a uh, Feast of Dedications, etc. Okay? So it's very, very important to understand that that chronology wasn't lost in the book of Revelation. People want to make the book of Revelation confusing. But the, Bible, the book of Revelation opens up with the Lord Jesus telling John, he said, write the things. He gives us the model of the book. He says, write the things which you have seen, write the things which are, and write the things which shall come after this, which shall be after the things that are. And so we, we lay, he lays out a chronology in the first chapter. And then to emphasize it even more, of course, when Jesus said, write the things which you've seen, we see chapter 1. Write the things which are, he addresses the church. And then write the things which shall be hereafter, metatato in the Greek language. And that word, that phrase does not occur until Revelation chapter 4. And it says metatato. So it literally sets up, now these are the things that shall be hereafter. Now, what people do, they're challenged with dealing with the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter because there is a transition of covenant. There's a transition of covenant that takes place in the book of Revelation. 
and I want you to be able to see it. I want to emphasize to you the chronology. You could not have more of a chronology than to have it broken down. It is a seven-year period clearly defined. It's broken down into years. It's broken down into months. And it's broken down into days. And then it goes even further. It doesn't just stop with saying you're going to go in 1,260 days. I mean, it, it doesn't just break it down into year, uh, uh, a period, a year, months, and days. It goes and says, now we're going to have seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it's going to be followed by seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it's going to be followed by seven vials. Uh, 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 bowls of judgment poured out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The end. I mean, what could be more numerical and what could be more chronological, chronological than that? And why it is that people want to confuse this, I'm going to give you one reason. Because they try to make their doctrines fit, and the only way they can make their doctrines fit is to eliminate their chronology. Well, I'm not going to violate the chronology. I'm going to talk to you on the terms of the things which are, the, are things which you've seen. I'm not going to be talking about what things which you've seen, which is chapter 1, seeing Jesus as he did. I'm not going to be talking about the things which are, which is addressed to the seven churches, which I don't have a problem with saying that it also represents seven different you know, states that the church may be in. I don't have a problem if you want to spiritualize. It doesn't matter to me. It's the, the things that aren't because the things that aren't means it applies to the whole church age, okay? And, but the bottom line of it is, it's very critical that you understand that there is a resurrection of the just. And the resurrection is part of the catching away and God makes it part of the catching away. And, and Paul makes it very clear that it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We should be caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and that it is part of the resurrection. You don't want to deal with the, in, in, in despise or, or mess up on the re resurrection. People say rapture is not in the Bible. That is nonsense. Catching away is in the Bible over and again. Rapture is a loan word, but what people are saying, they're saying, there's, they're saying that there is no catching away in the Bible. That if anybody says that and they present themselves as a scholar, they're one of two things. They either lied about being a scholar or they lied about what they know the Bible says. One of two things. They either lied about being a scholar because they present themselves as a scholar and they don't know the Bible, or, and they don't know the language, okay? Or they lied about the actual things that they know. Because I'm telling you, you don't need special glasses for this. Hallelujah. I mean, all you got to do is be like a little child and you can get this, okay? We understand that we should not all sleep or we should not all die. But th that some of us will be changed in the moment. In, at the last trump in the moment and twinkling of an eye. And that is very, very important. That we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. So, the Lord, so Paul lays it out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Lays it out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let me say this. I can lay out many proofs for you that Paul believed that he was going to be alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And he always talked about coming of the Lord Jesus. He didn't talk about we're going through the tribulation. It's going to be hectic, man, the Antichrist. Paul didn't say nothing about that. He said, when we said, we, he included himself, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That is the word that people say doesn't exist in the Bible. It exists in the Greek language. It exists in the English language. And there is a loan word that people made um, derived from a Latin word, rapture. So big deal. So you can, it's a synonym. So what's wrong with a synonym? You can't tell me that it doesn't exist in the Bible when it's a synonym. And yet you could properly translate the Greek words in such a way because it belongs to a living language understood and spoken by men. Okay? Are you with me? So don't believe that nonsense because there's a bunch of people right now that are actually teaching that we are under the, like, we're like in the, in the, in the, in the second trumpet. My goodness, if we were in the second trumpet, there wouldn't be any mountains. They're gone. Listen, there would be such devastation, such earthquakes, such peril, such plague. 25% of the population is destroyed. The, the waters are poisoned to where they destroy and kill men. I can go on and on and on. It's nonsense. I want, and that's why I got stirred up about, I'm going to start teaching on the book of Revelation because there's so much nonsense going down. People are so confused and, and people are so gullible and even furthermore, they're so trusting that they just go ahead and listen to what anybody's got to say. Go to your Bible and look it up. 
I said, go to your Bible and look it up and don't use it as a desk reference that you just consult based upon a, serious, uh, a particular question or, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an interest that you may have. Read it. Study it. Examine it. Okay? Very important. And so, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of review tonight because I want to help you understand really a lot of what the prophets have to say about just these first seven seals, just the first seven seals. By the first time the first seven seals have gone down, you, the earth is dramatically changed. Events have taken place that have never happened before. For example, the sun, the sun is completely blackened. What happens when the sun doesn't emit light? I'm telling you, you freezing. You're freezing in a way that you have never even imagined. There are, even under the seven seals, before the seven seals are even done, which is just the first part of the first three and a half years, the, the wind is held back. There is no wind. There's no wind blowing on the earth. There's been such devastating earthquakes that the mountains have, see, have been flattened. That there, there have been such events that the sea, the rivers have dried up. Huh. Peace is taken from the earth. There is total economic uh, um, uh, manipulation and control under one authority and one power. Men are destroyed by plagues that have never been heard of. We're in the second trumpet. I mean, you've got to be, there's got to be a screw missing. There has got to be some disconnect from reality on a level that I cannot even begin to imagine. And I hate to sound so negative and so, you know... Um, challenging but for me it just it, it hurts me so desperately to watch all these people funding these supposed scholars that are spilling a bunch of nonsense it's not the bible i'm going to tell you i'm going to warn you right now you listen to me jesus said by the servant john your name should be taken out of the book of life you better repent while there's still time for telling people the wrong thing and getting them set up where that the deception will work more effectively upon them because I'm telling you right now, right now, I believe that God's people need to be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's coming for every one who, who's standing there waiting and watching for his return. And um, these ideas and these philosophies take away from the waiting and the watching of, of his return. Everything that we do and every miracle that we move in in cooperation with God, it's because we have faith for it. We believed it from the word and we participated with the word and now have faith. I have faith for the catching away. And I don't believe that you, I don't believe you're going to get anything that the Word of God says without faith. From the healing of your body, the salvation of your soul, to the outcome of the Word of God. I believe you want to have a hookup with the Word of God because that's how faith comes, by the Word of God. Okay? So this is why this is so important to me. I'm not so much interested in people believing my ideas. I am interested in being a preacher of the gospel and everybody taking hold of God, what God has to say. So I'm going to talk about, you know, just, I'm just, you know, when you think about the seven seals being the first part of the three and a half years. It's just the opening scene. This is just the opening scene. This is the opening scene. The first seven seals could possibly take place in less than three months. It's very possible. And, 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 and the catastrophe, one catastrophe after another. People talking about blood moons. Give me a break. And that's what they say about blood moons. So I tell you, well, you know, it says in, it says in Genesis that you know, after all, the, the stars uh, are for signs and for seasons. Well, you know what? That is a bit of a weak translation to start with, and I'm not going to go into the various different ways you could translate that. But second of all, we live in an entirely different covenant. Hello. This is the day and time when the Holy Ghost has come to show us what's going to come to pass in the future, not the sun and the moon and the stars. We're not star readers. We're not, we not moon phase observers. Okay, well, the Lord told us not to even pay any attention to that. Paul said, don't even regard it. Hello. He knew the Gomera. He knew the various different philosophies and tradition of, uh, of, of reading the stars and, and, and discerning uh, times by the face of the moon better than any modern day person who is a Jew today, and he didn't talk one word about that. So I'm not going for that, and I pray in Jesus' name, you're not spoiled by philosophies and traditions and, and, and new moon feast and everything else, okay? Listen to me now. And, and I, you know what, I'm just going to say this too, see as I got my boots on. Uh, listen, this whole idea of replacement theology, give me a break. 
Replacement theology. What on earth are you talking about? Listen, Israel was brought into the kingdom of God. They were cut off. They can be grafted back in. Gentiles were now grafted and brought into the kingdom of God. They weren't brought into Israel. The church didn't replace Israel. There is no replacement at all. It doesn't even exist. Israel's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God existed far before Israel ever existed. We as a church was not, were not grafted into Israel. We were grafted into the kingdom of God. Jesus destroyed the middle wall of partition, a division, and he said, there is no difference between the Jew, hold on to yourself, and the Scythian. They were the most immoral, ungodly people on the face of the earth. And God says there's no difference between them. Because it's a new covenant. It's now the Lord has opened up the door for all men everywhere, Jew and Gentile, which, by the way, means nations, all other nations, to be able to be a part of the new covenant are made one new man, <laughs> thus having destroyed any difference or any partitioning or any segregation. <laughs> this is important for you. Because there's too many times I go and begin to deal with with uh, my Jewish brethren who've come in to know the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to try to help them understand the error in their theology and they immediately want to accuse me of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism. Huh, I'm not, there's no way I'm anti-Semitic. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. The Gentiles, the church was not grafted into Israel. So the church could never replace Israel. The church is made up of both Jew and Gentile. It's part of the kingdom of God. And if I could just get you to get that right. And I want to say this. I believe that the seven-year tribulation is about God dealing with Jacob's descendants. Dealing with the nation of Israel. That's why the centerpiece of the book of Revelation has to do with Jerusalem and the, and the city uh, 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 that God established in the nation of Israel and the occupied areas and territories of Israel. <laughs> it, it's so very important to me to emphasize that, that point. And, um, you know, that's why we call it Jacob's sorrow and Jacob's trouble. So, God's going to be dealing with Israel. He's turning back to deal with Israel, to plead with Israel. And um, it's just his mercy, okay? And that's really what a, a large part of it's about. God's last act of mercy towards Israel. They've been blinded in part. Well, and they that, you know, they were grafted, they were cut off because of unbelief, they're going to be grafted back in. So, I'm not anti-Semitic in no stretch of the imagination, okay? God's got a call upon the nation of Israel. He's got a call upon all the nations of the earth. He's going to deal with Israel for Abraham's sake and for Jacob's sake one more time. He's going to deal with them in a very radical way. And I'll just say this, <laughs> and this would be hard for you to figure out theologically. Um, because everybody talks about the abomination that makes the holies of holies desolate, which is going to ultimately take place in Israel when the Antichrist comes in in the middle of the tribulation after three and a half years, okay, which we can identify the very day and hour. And by the way, those people who believe that the catching away is going to come in the middle of the, tri of the tribulation, if that were to happen, which is the only other opportunity for it to take place, okay, there's really no other opportunity for it to take place from a scripture point of view, I could give you the day and the hour in which the Lord Jesus will return. Because the Lord has given us that exactness, that exactness of detail, okay? In fact, if there's catching away to take place, I could give you the very day and hour that is returned because I would know, because of certain signs and events that would take place, I would know the very beginning of the first day of the start of the tribulation. So I could give you the very day and the hour. So knowing that no man would know the day and the hour, there's an event that's going to take place that no man would know the day and the hour. And I tell you, that's catching away. And I tell you, that's what Paul believed he was going to be a part of. And I challenge everybody that does not believe in a catching away to tell me why then did Paul not talk about going through the tribulation because he believed he was going to be there at the second advent of Jesus. So you tell me. You tell me. Huh? You tell me. How would he believe, be able to believe that what most people call the second advent, which we know is the catching away, how did he believe that he was going to be there at the catching away, which people want to make it as a second advent, if he went in and go through the tribulation? And if he thought he was going to go through the tribulation, why didn't he talk about it? 
Huh? All he talked about was the church and what the church, where the church is going to go and what the church is going to do and how the church is going to end. And then, John came, and then John came along with the book of Revelation and said, this is what's going to happen after the church. And it's going to be focused on Israel. Now, let me just say this. <laughs> Listen to this. I'm going to tell you how radical the covenant change is. There's no way for the holies of holies to become desolate unless it's occupied. Are you listening to me? There is no way for the holies of holies to become desolate unless God goes and occupies the holies of holies. No way. So you tell me there's not a covenant change. You tell me there's not a shift. I tell you there is. I tell you that is why beginning in the book, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, all terminology returns to Old Testament cult terminology. Every, I challenge anybody, come let's talk about it. Let's look at it. We look at it from the Greek language, English language, Hebrew language. I'm not good at Latin, but, you know, I'll find somebody else to help you with the Latin if you need. We'll just discuss this issue. The fact of it is, Latin's not an original language, so I don't really care. Neither is English, but we'll talk about it in Greek and we'll talk about it in Hebrew. Because it's all Old Testament language. It's as though we did a time warp and went back to the Old Testament. I'm not saying that that is, the, that, 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 is that it's an Old Testament covenant reenacted. I am telling you that the morning and the evening sacrifice will be reinstituted. And that God will come and dwell in the holies of holies. And that that whole in interaction with the temple of God will once again be reactivated. Otherwise, you can't make desolate the holies of holies because it's already empty. Are you listening to me? So there's a lot of things that people need to deal with. And as I go through this, I'm going to, you know, we, we've had a number of interruptions this past month because the Lord laid on our hearts to go do some things that we needed to do for this nation that we believe were on the calendar in the kingdom of God. And so we were busy. But I'm going to try my best to keep the momentum going here the last Friday of every month because there is a lot of information to get through. There are current events that are taking place that are being shaped right now that people need to understand. Because people thought that Babylon would never be built again. Babylon will be built again. I'm going to assure you, it's not just spiritual Babylon. It's literal Babylon of Revelation chapter 18. And it didn't say New York. Because God got the ability to say New York and America or whatever else. He knows how to talk about what it is he knows to talk about. He can tell you about the future. His many proven times over and again where God's told us about the future. in 2,000, 3,000 years into the future. And he described it perfectly. Hello. Babylon will be the great center once again of the world. And, and you know, uh, there are things described, for example, in Obadiah and in Isaiah and Jeremiah that few people have never dealt with. Commonalities of Obadiah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, of where that ultimately, once again, Bozrah, uh, Edom, and Timon will be great centers again. Right now, they're rock, they're just rock rubble. But events are going to happen. And they're, they're, it's not going to just be a you know, pile of rock. It's going, they're going to be cities and people are going to wonder at him. And Jesus is going to go and execute his judgment in Bozrah before he ever gets to Armageddon. Who is this that comes with dyed garments from Bozrah, whose garments are dipped in blood? Huh? Who's executing his vengeance? Are you listening to me? He's going to stop. He's going to stomp Edomites out. Edomonians. Listen to me. The only way that we can, and then, 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 here you go, here's some current events for you. Get ready to stone me, okay? By and large, we understand historically Palestinians to be Edomonians, Edomites. And I know what's going to happen. Israel will indeed, not because of some kind of belief about replacement theology, because we don't believe it. We believe in the church, and yet at the same time, we know that God is going to deal with Israel for Abraham's sake, <laughs> because he's promised to do so. Hallelujah. And we understand that they will occupy all of Jerusalem, an event that has not happened, and that Temple Mount will be occupied by them as well, and that there will be a temple built to, for their abomination of desolation to take place. And we also understand that Edom and, and, and Bozrah and Timon will be built again, which is now nothing but a desert. I'm going to tell you right now, there's some geo, geo, geographical and social and political uh, events and economic events that are going to be dramatically changing over the next few years because we at the end days. Because I see, I, I don't see the Israel staying, I mean the Palestinians staying in Gaza. I don't see it. I don't see the Palestinians staying in the West Bank. I don't see it. I don't see 
that I, I don't see that event that would ultimately keep uh, or those conditions that ultimately keep these events from unfolding remaining as they are. I see, I see ancient Edom being rebuilt and repopulated again. Watch what happens. A homeland for the Palestinians. Watch what happens. Watch, I'm just saying this. I'm just saying what there's a lot of events that are going to ultimately be developed in order for the whole World Trade Center to be once again back there in the alliance in you know, ancient Iran and Iraq. You know, somebody said, how are the Sunnis and the Shiites ever going to get together? Divisions too, too deep. Well, when they both have a common enemy, they'll quit fighting one another, go fight the common enemy, and then they'll get back to their fight later. Are right, you listening to me? But then there's going to be some events that are going to transpire to where the, they're going to be brought together uh, and, and, and come under another kind of religious rule, which we call the seventh kingdom. And I'm not going to talk about that right now. And, um, and before too long here, I'm going to talk about the eighth kingdom. And the eighth kingdom is something that most people have never really dealt with. What the eighth kingdom really is, it's the final kingdom. It's the kingdom that emerges in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, which we call the great tribulation. It begins to be unfolded what's going on in there in the last of the trumpets and, and beginning the first vile judgments. As soon as that eighth kingdom, that perverse kingdom, where Satan comes down out of heaven and begins to interact with men again. He comes out of the unseen. He's cast out of the unseen and now begins to interact with men again as it happened even in the days of Noah. Watch what happens. There is going to be the rise of the occult. There's going to be the rise of witchcraft. There's going to be the rise of sorcery. There's going to be the rise of interacting with demon powers and angelic beings of darkness like no one ever even imagined in the last three and a half years, but building up to the last three and a half years. You know, it might have been not too long ago that we could not have even imagined how the men would have come and fight against God. But look at the effect of humanism. Look at the effect of Hollywood. How that they basically are making these aliens and create these aliens and, and man will all get together and they'll mount an offensive against these aliens, you know, and ultimately overthrow them. Ultimately, here's God saying, you're not going to have homosexuality. You're not going to have uh, adultery. You're not going to have witchcraft. You're not going to have the immorality. You're not going to have all of the things that you're doing. And they're going to say, no, we're going to come and break off your bands from off of us. We will not let you rule over us. You're going to try to invade our, invade our lives and our human society. And we're not going to allow it. And they're led by the arch deceiver, Satan himself, who ultimately believes true because he's a, re a rebel and a deceiver that he can still overthrow God. He's been trying to overthrow God for a long time. He tried to bring the host of heaven against God. Isaiah told us about it in Isaiah chapter 14. Tried to bring the host of heaven against God to overthrow God. He, he was cast to the ground, Jesus said, as lightning. Is cast to the ground. He has not stopped. Yeah, I, I believe in Job. He's got a contest. He's saying, look, he's trying to get God to abdicate. I believe this. He's saying, there's nobody who loves you and wants to serve you on the earth. Satan, where have you been? I just came from walking up and down the earth. And basically the inference is, no one walks with you. Because immediately Father said, did you consider my one servant? <laughs> My perfect servant Job, who then ultimately stands for us as a type of Christ. Because he's being willing now to be God's champion. To suffer whatever he's got to suffer on the behalf of humanity. To prove that there's a man who wants to walk with God. Who's willing to walk with God no matter what. It's true. Satan rises up. He's going to rise up in the tribulation and try to lead a great army against God. It's not going to be the end. Yes, was he destroyed 2,000 years ago? Yeah, but he don't believe a bit word of it. He's going to try to overthrow God. He don't believe it right now. He doesn't believe that you redeemed. He believes he can claim you and destroy your soul in hell. You don't have to find yourself a place of authority. I'm going to be ministering this weekend on the authority that Christians are too afraid to embrace. Ruling, reigning authority that God has given us that Satan fights against it with his circumstances and with all of his tricks and all of his wiles to keep God's people from stepping over into. <laughs> the Father's going to allow in his mercy and his grace... Some people are going to get this. They're going to quit being under the influence of Satan's criticism, his lies, his division, his slander, his, all of his other nonsense. Hallelujah. I'll be one of those people. And I pray in Jesus' name, you'll be one of them too. Amen. So, you know, if you look at just Revelation chapter 6 and you look at Revelation chapter 7, you're basically seeing there 
the first seven seals. And you know what happens on the seventh seal? The seventh seal starts the trumpet judgments. Seventh seal initiates the trumpet judgments. And then the seventh trumpet initiates the seven vial or seven bowl judgments, okay? So what I want to so show you real quickly, and I, and I can't overemphasize, you've got to keep it chrono chronological. You've got to keep it day one, day two, day three, all the way up to 1,260 days. You've got to keep it, those divisions as it's laid out also in Revelation, but also in Daniel of, of three and a half years, and understand the months that are at work, the division of the months that are at work, okay? And, the, and that, understand that these are a sequence of events, and I've gone over them, and I also want to say this. <laughs> You know, before you even get out of the seals, which once again, I'm going to say you can argue, maybe it's three months. Well, even if it's, it's the first year of the tribulation, okay? And you divide it into the thirds there for the first, you know, if you took seven, just take seven seals and seven uh, trumpets and divide them equally among, you know, three and a half years, okay? The, the total number of months would be, what, 30 months? Is that right? 12, uh, three, times, uh, three times 12, 36, and then a half a year, so... Uh, 36 plus 6 would be what? 42, correct? 42 months, right? So divide them, so you basically take those, those uh, 17, uh, forgive me, 14 events, divide them by 42, and just make them equal like that. And you can see, my goodness, there's a lot of events that are going to happen in just a few months. Are you with me? And so before, you know, because somebody said we're in the second trumpet. Oh my goodness gracious. I mean, just, if you took just this one thing, that all of the kings, from slaves all the way to kings, slaves all the way to kings, now, are hiding and running on the run from all the events. The heavens have been snapped together like a scroll, and men standing on the earth can look up in the heaven. Can anybody go out there and look up in the heaven and see God sitting on the throne, Jesus at his right hand? Well, I sure haven't. But that's what's going to be the condition in the first few months, before the seven seals are over, before the two trumpets ever sound. And they're crying out, hide us, calling for the rocks to hide them. Okay? From the face of the Lamb, from Him who sits upon the throne. My goodness, dear people, we've just got to be sensible about this whole thing. Okay? And, um, you know, talk about absolute economic control, peace taken from the earth, you know, just in the first four seals. And my, the plagues that would destroy men. Not to talk about the great earthquakes, which I did last time, so I don't want to go through that again. You'll have to go and get the tape. I'm sure the YouTube is up by now. Has anybody seen the YouTube? Good, so the YouTube is up. Now what I want to do quickly is I want to look at the three companies of people that are identified under the, in the, just in the initial part of the opening book of tribulation. In the, in the opening book of the tr uh, opening statements of the, of the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, three companies of saints are identified under the seven seals. And I want you to look at them with me because they're important to, to identify, okay? So in um, Revelation, and then I want to talk to you a little bit. I want to read some of the scriptures to you that kind of help you understand the events that are unfolding just in the first three and a half years of the book of, uh, of Revelation, which sometimes I mistakenly say the book of tribulation, okay? Now, verse 9 of Revelation chapter 6 identifies a company of saints that we know are those who are a company of people that are, that are martyred at the very beginning of the tribulation. So I want you to know that as soon as this, undergo, this takes place, I mean, they're already threatening to put us in jail, you know, if we, you know, talk bad about um, you know, homosexuals or other groups because they're going to say, you know, it's, you know, acts of some form of prejudice or violence or whatever, you know. And, you know, that goes on and on. It's going to get worse. It's just the early stages of men's hatred for God and morality and the church and Christianity and our absolute stand against unrighteousness and, and holiness. But what I want you to see is at the very onset, the very, very onset of the tribulation, the, the saints of God are going to start being martyred for the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's what's identified here in verse 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, the fifth seal unveiled for us the ability to see all of the martyrs that are being killed and slain right now 
because of their position and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So somebody says, oh, doesn't that identify for us that the church is going through the tribulation? Absolutely not. It identifies for us that there are going to be people who are turning to the Lord and standing for the Lord in the tribulation. But this isn't going to be the only company, okay? So they say, and when he opened the fist till I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So you got preachers. Now what happens is people say, aha, it must be the church. But it's not the church. There's too many proofs that it's not the church. The reality of it is there are going to be people who are going to, who are going to miss the catching away, who are going to right away turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe it's both Gentile and Jew. I don't, I'm not going to limit it to the Jewish people in this particular instance. But what we hear the Lord say is he cries with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little while in the season until their fellow servants, also their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So what the Lord is setting up here is that there's going to be a whole bunch more martyrs yet to come and that they're not going to be allowed to step in to the place of the resurrected saints until this period of time is, to, is, is finished, okay? So for them, it's, it's, you could say that to die is to be with the Lord, but it's very unique. They are held in a place of, of confinement until that particular dispensation of time is over. For you and I to die right now, we go right in the presence of the Lord, and when we go in the presence of the Lord, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're not naked, he clothes us with a, temp a temple. We're clothed with a temple. We're clothed with a body of some sort, waiting for the resurrection of the body. I don't fully understand what Paul said in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but I do know the bigger point of the thing. We immediately stand in the presence of the Lord, and we're not floating around like some spook, you know, that get intangible. Hey, Mark, is that you? No, you can see me, you know. Uh, I just felt a wind go by me. It must have been Stuart. No, you can see him, you know. But the bottom line of it is it's unique. It's unique. What happens to the dead in Christ and now, at this point in time, under the fifth seal, is unique from anything that has been revealed about the New Testament saints in the epistles uh, of, of Paul. So, very important point to, to, to include, to grab a hold of. And so then, you know, um, I want to jump right now to another company of, of saints that are seen in heaven. Now, I want you to see these company of saints, they are not under the altar. Are you with me? These are not being wait. You're not having to wait, and uh, until all the rest of your brethren that are killed as you are are killed. These are a unique company of saints. They are standing there before the throne of God. And here's the beautiful thing about them. Let's look at this company of saints. Remember, those company of saints that are being killed in the tribulation, they got to wait till their fellow servants are killed, and their fellow servants are going to be killed all the way through the whole of the seven year period. We can prove that. Okay. Now, we're looking at a company of people that are not at the end of the tribulation, not at the middle, but at the beginning, under the chronology of those events that take place at the very beginning. Look at these guys. And this, there's some beautiful things about these guys. Number one, and I beheld, and lo, fixed my microphone. To, I don't know what happened. A great multitude, please turn it down or something. A great multitude which no man could number of all nations... Of all kindreds, look at this. Look, can you see this? Is everybody with me? Yes. Look, huh? listen to this. People are blinded to this. All kinds of distractions happen. Microphones go through the roof. People go to sleep. They all of a sudden start talking, thinking about the hamburger that somebody didn't give them at In-N-Out Burger. They, they, they need to go back and redeem their money so they didn't get shorted a hamburger. Okay, all the other distractions. I want you to get this right here. Here it is. This is the church in living color. Standing in the throne room of grace at the very beginning of the tribulation, look at them. And after I beheld a great multitude which no man could number, I'm very encouraged about that. Yes. Huh? Somebody said, Oh, no, there was only a, no one in his family saved, only eight made it. I wonder how many is going to be standing. Wouldn't it be terrible if there's like eight people standing around the throne of grace? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for redemption. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> hey, he, listen, it's going to be a great multitude. 
God's got an army that's going to go forth, as Joel described, so baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost, so full of the authority of God, Satan can't touch them. They have defeated Satan at every point. They don't live under the, the, the nonsense and the continual chatter of demon spirits. So many people in the church live under the continual chatter of demon spirits railing against the anointing, anointed people like me, railing against us. So that they cannot and will never, ever step in to this glory. they stuck in a prison of religion. But the Father's going to have this mighty, glorious army. And what does it say? It says a fire devours before they run. They have a face like lions. They run like the horses. A fire devours before them. And this is a garden of Eden before them. And behind them is a desolate wilderness. It's such a harvest that's nothing's left. It's what we call a minka in the Hebrew language. It's a minka offering. It's a whole burn offering. It's, 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 it's everything now being offered up. It's more than first fruits. It's everything, even the gleaning of the harvest. What a great harvest. Look at them. I saw an innumerable company of people, more than anybody could be able to number, of every nation. Listen, every nation. That's why I'm going for every nation. That's why I've got, that's why I have Kashmir on my, um, on, on my hit list. Chad's coming down in Jesus' name uh, from the kingdoms of darkness into the kingdom and up into the kingdom of the dear son. It stood before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. They've just come out of a great uh, battle that they fought. You and I are in a great battle. You might not recognize it. You think that all these ideas and thoughts running through your head are just something that is from some logical conclusion. Most of it's demonic inspiration that you need to learn how to shut down, pull down, stop, cast down. He says, and he, and he goes on to describe us up there. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, and, the, and, and cried with a loud, they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sit upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four and the four beasts fell before the throne and on the faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessed glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power might be unto God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said, Sir, don't you know? And he said unto me, he said, don't you understand? He's like saying, this is your company of people. Don't, what do you mean? You don't know who these guys are? He's talking to the leader of the church saying, what do you mean? You don't know who these guys are? This is your company. He said, these are they. He says in verse, in verse 15, therefore are they before the, uh, forgive me, verse 14. He says, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And I'm going to tell you right now. We live in great tribulation. There will be a great tribulation which is called the great day of his wrath, which is in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, which will take place under the vile or bold judgments. But these are another company of people that came out of a different kind of great tribulation. And if you haven't noticed lately, you're in the big middle of it. Hello. And people cave under its pressure. Huh? And as soon as anybody gets a little bit of an anointing, I watch Satan ta attack them, and many of them are just taken out. As soon as you get to a place of threaten, you're threatening now the kingdom of darkness because you stepped into a little bit more of anointing. You just, you, now you're dangerous. And then Satan's, gonna come, Satan's allowed to come at you just that much harder. And I watch people taken out all the time. Look, the church is neutralized by all these lies that Satan's, Satan's got a perfect strategy. He's got a perfect strategy where he's constantly running interference by people pointing the fingers at those that are anointed and constantly bringing down those things through arguments and strife and debates where the church can't be salt, can't be light. Imagine if the church of San Diego, California weren't living in division and, and accusation against one another. Imagine if the people in this church would quit living in division and accusation. Uh, listen to me. That's why slander or accuser is the same word for devil, is diablos. Because God says there's no different. If you a slander or accuser, he calls you a devil. In fact, if it says, consider the aged woman, Paul talking to Titus, right? What does he say? He said, let them be women of reverence, holiness, not giving them much wine, not devils. And of course, we can't say it that way. So we say, not accusers. But it's diablos. Because the devil is a slander. If, you could be, if God's people could just get smart enough to recognize the devices of Satan, that what he effectively uses to keep us from being the light that shines, the salt that preserves, a great awakening would have already taken place. 
people will be saved by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I am not going to run the risk of the Lord saying, you know what, I would have done a great revival in your church if you hadn't listened so much to the devil and constantly been being used by him to shut down the meeting by your accusations and, and your slander and your unwillingness to participate. That ain't going to happen with me. I pray it doesn't happen with you. I'm going to be all in with God. I'm going to be doing what my Father does. I'm going to do what Father shows me to do. He shows me in His Word. I'm going to say what Father showed me to say. Yeah. Showed me His Word. He told me, show, showed us how to walk in love, how to walk in His, in his ministry uh, uh, of laying down our lives one for another. We are in tribulation, dear people. <laughs> I want you to know it. We are in a battle against Satan. But right now, we have authority to overcome Satan. It, by the time they get to the great wrath of God or the last three and a half, Years of the tribulation, the great tribulation, they will not have authority to overcome Satan. Satan will have authority to overcome the saints. That's going to be hectic. And you know how they're going to die? They're going to die as martyrs. By and large, when you look at the book of, of Revelation, the people that go from the tribulation into the first resurrection saints are martyrs. That's the only definition we have for people getting into heaven. It's a different transition. You've got to go by way of death. Because we only have to know of two others that are raised up from the dead. And that's the two witnesses that come, that stand. Which we, which we believe to be Enoch and Elijah. Some people say, no, 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 it's Moses and Elijah. Because they're two of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Well, it can't be Moses. Because Moses already died. Huh? What, how's it going to get back here? Is it going to get reincarnated? He's already died. There's only two men who've never died. And that's why we conclude it's Enoch and Elijah, two men reserved, two witnesses standing before the Lord. Are you with me? Okay. How am I, how are we going to get Moses back here? His bones are buried where nobody can find them. Huh? Huh? At best, he's been raised up to, from the dead with Jesus at the time Jesus was raised up. It's possible. You know what's possible? Many saints came up out of the ground when Jesus rose from the dead. Right? I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. It's not revealed. I'm just saying. At best, he's got a resurrected body. What's it going to do? Are you with me? At best. Otherwise, the Lord's going to have to raise him to, to life again, which I'm not going to put past God. He's going to have to raise him to life again from his bones. Someone's going to have to go out there, wherever he's at, raise him to life again from his bones, which God can do. And he's going to have to die a second time. So is it completely out of the question? No. Because God can do anything. But it just doesn't stand within the context of why does God have two people who never died that are two prophets, both of them for prophets for the end time. Elijah was so upset because he believed he was the prophet that would initiate God's kingdom coming. And when it didn't go down like he thought it was going to go down, he said, All's, you know, he goes out to the, you know, he goes out into the middle of the desert and says, I want to die because she's still in charge. Huh? Because he's an end time prophet. What did he let Enoch prophesy? Why is, it that, why is it that Jude picks up one of the most important prophecies of Enoch? Enoch was the prophet that stood at the moment of the last great judgment, the judgment of the flood. And he prophesied of a day when the Lord would come with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. And he wasn't talking about the days of his grandson. Huh? Are you with me? He was talking about the days of this that we now live in. Pretty radical. So it's perfect. It's perfect, isn't it? So I hope, I hope you grasp that. I hope you understand the reasons why, in verse 9, this company of saints, this innumerable company of saints, is already, it's, once again, it's chron chronological. We're not in, the, tribula we're not in the, the finality of the tribulation. That's still yet seven trumpets have still got to happen. One more seal still got to happen. Seven more trumpets have still got to happen. Seven bowls have got to happen before you're going to have all the company of the saints. And it doesn't say that these came out of great tri tribulation having been killed, okay, in the great tribulation because we've got a distinction. We've got a distinction between those who are martyred in tribulation and killed in the tribulation, and these who are standing before the throne. Those that are martyred and killed in this tribulation are under the altar. They cannot come out and stand upon the throne before the living God until all of their brethren that are going to be killed in the tribulation are killed in like manner as they were killed, and then they are going to be clothed at, after that time. Are you with me? Are you with me? There, God set up two distinct companies of people so that we could clearly see the difference between the tribulation saints and those caught away at the very beginning 
of the tribulation. So we understand where we're at. We understand the context of things. We know that we, we read in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, that the hereafter is now started. These things which shall be hereafter, as I referred to early on in the book of Revelation, write the things which you've seen, write the things which, forgive me, write the things which are, write the things which, forgive me, write the things which you've seen, write the things which are, and write the things which shall be hereafter. The hereafter has come. We see the unveiling of so many different events in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, the Lord lets us see right off at the very beginning a unique company of people that are already redeemed, already washed, already received their resurrected, uh, resurrected bodies, standing before the throne of God in contrast to those who are being martyred in the tribulation. You see that? Yes. Hope you do. Now, let's look at a third. In, this, this is the last thing I want to talk about in terms of these three companies of people that are identified under the first... Under the, under, at the beginning of the tribulation, under the first seven seals, under the first six seals, really, okay? And then is this unique company here in um, chapter 7, and uh, it is this company uh, that God's going to make exempt from any of the plagues. This is the only people that can't be touched by the plagues. The tribulation saints, they're going to get touched by the plagues. They're not only going to get martyred, they're also going to be subject to the plague. Okay? This company of saints, they are called, it says, so. And, and after these things, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that they should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on the trees. Think about that. No wind. You talk about things being heated up. Huh? If the, the sun has been darkened for a period of time, and so it's gotten incredibly, extremely cold, okay? There's been major earthquakes that have caused the mountains to disappear into the sea. It, every volcano that could have erupted has erupted, okay? We've now, in, in, now we're sitting in a situation where now no wind is going to blow upon the earth. But things aren't just, and they, this is just warming up. It, it ain't even gotten bad yet. And so now what the angel says is, he says, and I saw an angel sin from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to the four angels to whom, was, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Get ready. Okay. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And he specifically identifies them as 144,000 Jews and identifies them all 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. There's no spiritualization needed here. It's very pointed. It's very perfect. It's very context, context to exactly what God's doing in his dealing with Israel in the time of Jacob's sorrow. And see, because Jeremiah prophesied 70 weeks, Daniel understood the 70 weeks that were determined upon the people of Israel and upon the nations of, uh, uh, of the earth, the Gentiles. And 69 weeks of those things that God would do in the dealings of Israel have been completed. And they were completed at the very moment in time when Messiah was cut off. There has been at this point almost 2,000 years between the 69th week and the 70th week of Jeremiah's prophecy and Daniel's revelation. Okay? I'll get into that later. I'm not getting into that tonight. All I'm doing is still... You know, there's a second phase, just setting up the introduction. I want you to understand this. I've got piles of scripture on this. I mean, you can argue all you want. I'm fine. Go ahead, argue. Let me hear what it is that you've got to say. Because with every point, I'm going to tell you, the Lord will give you 10, 15, 20 points to help you understand. Okay? Because that's just the way he is. He gives us plenty of information so we can understand the word if we're willing to study it. Look at this now. So I want you to understand that these... 144,000, they're the servants of God. That means they're going to do the work of the Lord. They're the servants of God to do the work of the Lord. They're sealed, so none of the, none of the plagues can hurt them, okay? And I want you to look at exactly who they are because chapter 14 tells us exactly who they are because they're going to stick around now for the first part of the tribulation. They got a job to do, okay? They can't be hurt. My goodness, think about it. They can't get killed. They can't get killed. They're the only ones can't get killed. Everybody else is dying right and left. 25% of the earth gets killed here. 25% 20, of the man gets killed here. 25% of the earth gets destroyed over there. I mean, one thing after another. The moon gets turned to black, not to blood moon, black. I mean, forgive me. Um, 
the, the, the moon should be turned to blood. Not just a blood moon, I mean just a blood. The sun should be turned black. Not just, not just dimmed or eclipsed, black. Cut off from any kind of, any kind of view from the earth. And it's not, it's not an eclipse. It's not an eclipse. It's blackened. It's darkened. I mean, you talk about how cold it's going to be upon the face of the earth. So, I mean, all of these great events are way beyond anything that has ever happened to the earth. And I'm, I keep saying this over and over again because there's too many people on television right now that are supposedly being given the license to know and divulge what's happening right now with respect to prophecy and saying we're in the second trumpet. By the second trumpet, my goodness gracious, the whole place is completely wrecked. I mean, come on. It is such, it's, a different, it's a different earth by then. It's a different geography by then. I mean, angels are flying around preaching the gospel. I mean, you've got demon locusts coming up out of the earth by this time. You've got scorpions stinging men and destroying men. And they, 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 got, they got faces like a man, hair like a woman, and a sting like a, like a scorpion. And they come right up out of the pit of hell, and they're not some kind of helicopter. These are demons. <laughs> These are demons, tar demons that are grabbing people, grabbing them by the head and sticking their stinger right into their chest. I mean, tormenting people. It's the worst nightmare. I mean, Hollywood's not even come up with what's going to happen by the second trumpet. How can people be so off their rocker? There is going to be such meteor showers, even under the first seven, six seals, meteor showers that are going to plague the earth, that the kinds of stars, the heaven should be shaken, the stars of heaven should fall. We know that those are meteors. They're going to rain down upon the earth. They're in the midst of an earthquake that will cause the mountains to be leveled and cast into the sea and be no more. And you think about just the whole you know, um, physics of a big meteor hitting the earth. And, the, and the, I mean, it's like a nuclear explosion. Yeah. And it's a fact. Once again, it's creating a dust cloud by itself that, will keep, that, will, could, that could cause a nuclear winter. And then on top of that, the sun's darkened. It's freezing, man. We're piling. We're burying snow. We're walking around frozen for I don't know how long. It may only be a couple months. But it's going to be that one. The torment, the torture, the upheaval. It literally, the earth is spewing out sin and iniquity. It can't handle it anymore. That's what it's, the scripture says. The earth has been burdened and plagued with the sin and the iniquity of men so long it cannot take the iniquity and the immorality of man anymore. It spews out man from off the earth. Praise God. I'm happy about that because I'm not in that company. I hate iniquity. I hate evil. Every form of it. Amen. So I just want to show you who the 144,000 is because we just got a little bit of an introduction to them in that, in that, in that uh, statement there in chapter 7. Verse 14, chapter 14 rather. Here's who they are. And I behold, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him was a 444,000 having their father's name written in their forehead. Wow, that's beautiful. Hallelujah. Father's name written there. Hallelujah. Yehoah written in the forehead. Pretty rad, huh? huh? Yod, Vav, He, Vav. Literally, Yod, Vav, He, Vav. Pronounced Yehoah. Written in his forehead. That's how you say his name. It's tetragrammaton. That's how you pronounce his name or write his name in Hebrew. Yod, He, Vav. He. Unmistakable. Invincible. Can't be touched by anything. Demon locusts come and see him and, you know, they scream out and run the other way. Anybody else? They on you. Okay, they to torment men. Demons will torment men. Now, demons try and torment. Demons try to torment you. When you recognize it, all torment is of the devil. All fear is of the devil. Every harassing thought, every beguiling thought, every thought of evil and iniquity, demonic harassment, they're my enemies. That's why I can throw it off so quickly. Because I've, I've found my weapons, you see. I've got God power. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, Satan's going to lie. He's going to tell all kinds of crazy things. He's going to make up things. If he don't have anything real, he's going to make it up. Huh? He's going to make it up about Joseph. He's going to make it up about me. You know, bottom line of it is, Father's going to defend us. He'll prove it at the end of the day. Amen? Amen. He'll defend you. Just walk with him. Just do it, do it his way. Amen. Amen. And, and so here we are. And I heard a voice, verse 2, from heaven, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. 
And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn the song except for the 144,000. Praise God. They get a unique position with God. These are unique guys. They had 12, they're men. So I had a woman come up to me and she said, are you part of the 144,000? I said, no. She said, I am. I said, you can't classify. She said, why not? I said, you're not a man. And I said, not only must you be a man, but you must be a virtuous man having never known a woman. And I don't think it's impossible. I think it's pretty much impossible that you have never known a woman seeing that you are a woman. Okay, so I'm <laughs> they look at you cross side, turn around and walk away. Well, I need to go find somebody else to talk about or talk to. These are they, verse 4, and I probably set it up. Like These are they which were not defiled with women. See that? Spiritualize that for me. It just is what it is. They virgins. They Never, they never married. They're celibate. They never married. They set apart to the Lord. Huh? These are they who never defiled with, were not, were, were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Somebody said, oh, no, I've been defiled by women. No, the Lord created, okay, a woman for a man. Praise God, because I personally needed one. Amen. I, that's the partner I wanted to go with. I wanted to go ahead and fulfill God's first plan that we should go and re, be a family and replenish the earth. I needed that. God placed within me the need to need that, and I'm happy with that. But there's very specific things that Father is also saying about the purity of celibacy in this particular context. Okay? doesn't do away with his plan for Eve or for Adam. Praise God. Okay? <laughs> These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God and of the Lamb. And in their mouth, and, and, and so they say, ah, oh, see, they're the first fruits. But bring it into context. They're the first fruits of God from Israel during this period of time. At this event of the Israel turning back unto the Lord. Because go back to the context. Can't take it out of context. There's the first fruits of Achaia. Okay, there's the first fruits of the church. Jesus is the first fruits. You tell me that the first century church wasn't the first fruits? Give me a break. There's first fruits in every different context among every different group of people. This is the first fruits of the of the of Israel, twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. God reserved him twelve thousand during the days of during the days of of Elijah. He had a remnant in which he do, in which he reserved. Why? 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal, the remnant. Hallelujah. I'm part of the remnant right now. Praise God. Are you part of the remnant? God's got a remnant. God's got a remnant. They're holy and undefiled. God's got a remnant who believe his word, who kept by the power of God. Hallelujah. Rule Sabbat Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And um, then, then look at this. I just want to get this up. Get this up. And their mouth, and in, get this, listen. And in their mouth was found no guile. Are you listening to this? Yes. They never talked bad about anybody ever. In their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault. Oh, that's pretty perfect. They were without fault before the throne of God. So they walked before the throne of God from the very day that they were sealed, without fault, without any guile, doing everything that He said for them to do. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. And then I saw, an, and I love this, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them to dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice. And, and you know what reality of it is, is the angels are preaching the gospel through the tribulation, and you'll see over and again where men have all of these events, and God's looking for them to repent, and it says, and still they would not repent, because you're living in a day of great apostasy. And we see that apostasy taking place. I mean, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. And, and reality of it is, here's what I see. I see that everybody that gives their life to the Lord in the tribulation and becomes a martyr, they the last little gleaning. they the last little gleaning in God's mercy. The last little gleaning. We're all deception. Anybody who could possibly be delivered in the power of deception, they're the last gleaning. They're the last attempt of God to glean from humanity. Because I believe that the Lord's going to come when there is no more harvest. There would be no more harvest without these kind of events taking place. And so these events take place, and then there is a gleaning. And it's not a great company of people. 
the great company of people are from another, another time period, they're the church. And I don't think that, I don't think that men, I'm going to say this, for the sake of being re redundant, I don't think that Bible scholars and Bible teachers have done justice to dealing with these three companies of people that are identified right there in the book of tribulation, I'm the book of tribulation, book of Revelation under the first seven seals in the first chapter that, that, that reveals these things that are going to go on in tribulation. Because God makes a very clear distinction between those who are servants that are going to go and minister and instead who are, who are, who are protected from all of these things, the, these wrath and the plagues and the outcome of these plagues can't touch them versus those who basically are there and they deserve it. They're under the yoke of the plagues and they're going by way of martyrdom, but nonetheless, they're still being saved. And those who are not, clearly not part of the tribulation martyrs because they're not held in the same compartment that tribulation martyrs are held in underneath the altar. I want you to see that. Deal with it. Wrestle with it. Read every commentary you can on it. Listen to all the nonsense that's out there that don't make and nonsense because it doesn't make any sense what they're saying. Okay? Three distinct companies. They've got to fit the bill. Somebody says, oh, that innumerable company? They part of the tribulation. No, they're not. Otherwise, they'd be under the altar. Huh? And you can't have all the company, the whole of the tribulation saints. They're at the beginning of the tribulation because it ain't just got started. Right? So there has to be a sensible explanation. Now, I want to real quickly, what time is it? 8 to 5. I want to try to keep this to an hour. But I just really want to, I real quickly, I want to read to you some of the things that, that the, that the, prophets of old said concerning these last days, okay? And I want to point out to you that the prophets of old saying consider, concerning the events leading up to the tribulation and the tribulation that there would be great civil war, um, the issues concerning the sun and the moon, the issues concerning stars of heaven shaken, and the issues of, of uh, the sea and the rivers being dried up. Anybody notice the sea and the rivers dried up out there? Okay, and they ain't dried up, are they? Okay, so I just want to just quickly, real briefly go over this with you. Haggai chapter 2 says, I will, sh in, in verse, uh, in, I'm picking it up at verse 21. He says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of kingdoms, of the heathen. I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and the riders shall come down. Every person shall be destroyed by the sword of his brother. God's talking about great civil war. That's how this judgment and this wrath comes upon men. We see it. We're, seeing, we're going to see a continual rise of it. Watch this. Ezekiel 28, uh, th forgive me. Ezekiel 38, 18. This is what the Lord says. And it shall come to pass in that same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel. And of course, now we know we're in the tribulation here, says God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the earth, shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down. And we see that that's happened in the first part of the tribulation. The mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for sword against him throughout all my mountains says God and every man's sword shall be against his brother once again there is great civil war during the time of the tribulation with all this with all this upheaval going on you would think it'd be bad enough just the things that are coming down okay within the perspective of what's happening happening in the natural circumstances as it were earthquakes volcanoes stars falling meteors falling from sky then the supernatural stuff, when the, when the pit, uh, 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 when the hell is open and the pit is open and all the demon locusts and all the demon power and all the angels are loose. Angels are going to be loose out of River Euphrates right now. Reserve River Euphrates is going to do all kinds of terrible deeds and, and things to men. You think that'd be bad enough? No, it's not stopping there. Man's going to be doing terrible things to men as well. And then Isaiah 19, 2, And I will set the Egyptian against the Egyptian, and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Civil war. The Lord said there will be war, rumors of war. 
nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And I'm telling you, it wasn't, it's not something that just is necessarily one event. It's a continual event. Now, what the Lord did say is that at the, as, as the day draws near, that the events would have greater sequence and frequency, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it would be like a woman and her birth pain. So you see all these troubles that are pre-tribulation troubles. It's not like we're going to have this wonderful big period of, re of, 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 of rest. Once again, it's like the contractions of labor. We're going to see wars and, and, and rumors of wars. And I'm going to tell you right now, you better get ready because Putin wants to start a fight. He's a KGB man who believes that Mother Russia should rule the world. And his nuke subs were seen in our waters just two months ago. They trespassed in our territorial waters just two months ago. And he's saying, come NATO, just, just do anything because I'll fire on America at a drop of a hat. It, I'm going to bring the war to you. That's the strategy. And we're, we are living in the hot spot of it right here because there's more... Uh, uh, missiles and, and defense systems right here in San Diego than any place in the western United States. Our nuke subs are here. Our nuke silos are here in Point Loma. Our, our, our military shipyard, our military bases, the biggest stockpile of nuclear warheads are right up here in L.A. They're going to take it out. They're going to take out San Onofre, San Onofre because it will create contamination for hundreds of miles around. I mean, people, we live on the edge of great devastation, and that's just from a basic war. That's just a basic war basic war it's a the, israel has got to go take out the nuclear threat, threat in iran they are going to have to respond ultimately to what's going on with hezbollah as much as they're having to respond to um the hamas right now because it's spreading what's it's going to spread it's it's on fire it's on fire syria and in iraq and iran are going to join together and even, even though 10 years ago, people would have said it would be impossible because the great division between the Sunni and the Shiite is going to happen because they've got a common enemy. They'll defer their fight between themselves and go fight their common enemy. Israel's got to get in the mix of it. Iran, Russia's standing by Iran just saying, mess with them, mess with them, and we're on you. Huh? And listen, dear people, there's a lot of reason for us to be praying. We know, here's what we know, commonly, this is what we know, that America stood at a crossroads and made the wrong decision. Because as long as we would join ourselves in the Lord, there would be a preservation, there would be a protection. But here we are. I'm not saying a judgment's going to come. I'm saying an act of mercy is going to come. And that, that, that the things that have blinded people's hearts and made people so, so arrogant and so rebellious and defiant against God. <laughs> Listen, this nation was bound and dedicated to God, and you can't take it back and hand it over to the devil and think that you're gonna, there's not going to be a violation of spiritual laws. Here we are, be we in a serious situation here. The, econ the economy is changing. The world economy is changing. I, I'm, 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 listen, I'm going to tell you, I was with people who are on the inside of things that are going on in this nation. They told me things that I can never repeat. If I repeated them right now, I, I would be visited tonight, believe me. I would be visited as soon as the word got out. We don't know all the things that the Lord has prevented this past 12 months that was purposed to go down, and it was put this way. It can't be stopped. It's going to happen, and ain't nobody can stop it. And this was by some of the highest people in decision-making in government and military power, and God prevented it because of His mercy. Once again, give it another opportunity, give another opportunity, give another opportunity. 2011, the Lord told me, there is time, there's a window of time to prepare, and I've run. I've not let up. I've run wide open, preparing for the coming days. And I'm, I, I and, and you know, they told us here, for example, in this building, you know, the powers that be, the principalities that says, oh man, you're going to have to tear down the building, or you're going to have to do all these reconstruction. I'm not going to be moved. The Lord has given us this property. So we're just going to start having church right out there until we get all the stuff settled. We're going to have church right out there. We're going to get ourselves a tent, you know, a pavilion tent. We're going to have church right out there because I'm not moving. You know why? Because I can see in the midst of great devastation, you know what? You're going to really shine with brightness. When fire's burning, you can't be burned. Huh? When fire's burning everywhere, you can't be burned. Hmm? When trouble's everywhere and you untouched, amen, because I already got my seal. I've been sealed by the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost seal right over here. Amen. I've been sealed by the Spirit of the Lord. Praise God, so have you if you've been born from above. 
And here I see this property is a great opportunity, not only to process thousands and tens of thousands of souls in a humanitarian uh, way, but more importantly, in a spiritual way. Can you imagine people praying for revival? What a great revival happens, and there's tens of thousands of people coming into the kingdom every day. My goodness, what are you going to do? I can't do it all by myself. You're going to have to get yourself an anointing real quick to help out. Huh? And if you always constantly overwhelmed by your circumstances, how are you going to tell somebody else that all is well and that they can trust in God? God's given them power and authority, and there's, God, there's provision, and there's meat of plenty. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to multiply the loaves and the fishes, plenty of opportunity for great miracle of provision because this is what it's going to take. Huh? This I can say. I was with some people in the know. And they point, and I was in D.C., they pointed to the building and said, see this building? See the administrative building? All the officers are set up. They're all ready to go. It's all set for the gold standard. It's, everything's all ready. All the administration is put into place. All they got to do is push the button. It's all about a transition because it's a complete, your dollar has zero value. Zero value. I was telling some, day, I was telling some guys today with, with spits left, I said, look, Dollar might not mean, mean anything, but that right there is a product that has value because it's one and it's trade for gold. And you've got to understand that. We, this is where we go. And if, if I've got wisdom, if I can see these things coming, then I can prepare. If I'm saying, Father, I want to be a part of the last day's harvest, the end time harvest, because I know every nation is going to be impacted. I'm not saying that God can't use China and that, or that he needs me to be involved. I want to be involved. <laughs> and I'm not going to be left out. So I want the latitude to be able to move. Missions are going to be just as big in the inner city. Missions are going to be just as big in the United States as it's going to be in, 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 in Pakistan or it's going to be in, in Iran or it's going to be in Azerbaijan or Georgia or, or um, you know, wherever on the face of the earth. It's going to be just big here, but I want to be involved in all of it. I want to, be a, I want to play a key role. I want to just look. It takes a while to step into faith. Huh? You're not just, you're not just one minute you're lost, he that don't know anything, next minute you have faith. You t it takes time. It takes faithfulness. It takes dedication to walking God's ways and obeying spiritual laws to, to be developed into faith. There's just not going to be time for people to be developed into faith. We're going to have to have people who've been developed into faith mobilized go do it. Are you listening to yeah. me? Come on now. Yeah. Huh? You don't just step out and do things like this. Are you with me? Do just get devoted and bother and make sure you get matured into it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let me just get a few more of these here out to you. And then sun and the moon, of course, there's three events just in the tribulation alone of the sun being darkened and the moon uh, uh, being turned into blood. And it isn't the blood moon that people are describing right now. We're talking about the, we're talking about the moon being turned into red as blood we're talking about we're talking about an event that has never happened before ever in the in in the history of men and it's not accompanied by some series of red moons it's accompanied by a sun made black that is the only event that god has given to us for, for to help us understand where we're at a moon made may turn to blood in in, 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 at the same time, at the same moment, in a parallel event to the sun made black. Can't miss that one. Is everybody with me? Yes. Don't listen to the rest of this stuff. Don't listen. It's nonsense. It's a destruction. It has no scripture to bake basis at all. At all. Somebody said, oh, well, this says in Genesis chapter 3, and it says in Psalms 100. Listen. There's several ways to translate that to begin with. And second of all, we're in another covenant now. We're in a covenant where the Holy Spirit shows us things that are to come, not the stars and the phases of the moon. Paul didn't say, listen, guys, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to give you an insight. We're watching the phases of the moon right now because the Lord is showing me. Nonsense. Nonsense. One hand, everybody's saying, live by the word, only teach the word. And the other thing, on the other side, they're over here talking all this nonsense, all this, all this, all of this philosophy and tradition and speculation and fantasy. It's distraction. It's running interference. Satan always does that. The Lord says, but in those days after the tribulation, see? So we see the sun and the moon darken at the beginning of the tribulation, Right? And the seven seals. Now, Jesus talks about 
a time where the sun and the moon is darkened at the tribulation. And you see that in the book of Revelation because you see it three times. It happens, three events. If I'm not mistaken, it's either two or three events. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading Mark 13, 34. I'm sorry, Mark 13, 24. And after those days, and, and in, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. Wow, that's pretty radical, isn't it? That's more than a blood moon. No light. Are you with me? The stars of the heavens shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's at the end of the tribulation. That's when it's over. That's when he comes down out of heaven. And you see that at the end of the tribulation, after the seven, after the seven bowls. Okay? The sign of his coming is what? The sign of the major event is what? Moon gives no light, and neither does the sun. Freezing. Dark. How dark? So dark that men are tormented. Deep depression. You begin to chew on your tongue. There's no depression like that. People have told me about going up to Alaska and going during the time where it's 24 hours dark. And they were only there for three months and they went into acute depression. And they had to start taking, they got hospitalized because of depression because they couldn't handle it being dark like that. And that ain't really dark. Are you with me? How about when there's no sun? How about when there's no moon? How about when there's no star shining? They gnaw their tongue for, for torment and pain. I'm not going to be around that. I'm going to be standing on the sea, I'm going to stand on the sea of glass praising God for his goodness because he's not appointed his children under wrath. He's delivered us from it. Amen. I'm shut up in the ark. There might be a storm going around on outside, but I don't know it. I'm in the ark of safety. Amen. Hallelujah. We in the great provision of God. In fact, if it is, that's during the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb is provable, provable to be taking place during the tribulation. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb or at the tribulation. I'm the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to the appointed party. The night is coming. Darkness is coming. Great tribulation is coming for the church. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Great tribulation is coming for the church. There's been great tribulation in many days past. Some people right now in the church are living in great tribulation right now, being hanged on by their ankles. Some people are thrown down into pits in great darkness right now. And people are in great tribulation coming to the church. There's a, there's a time that's going to be so, you know, Jesus said, the night's coming when no man can work. Huh? I praise God for the fact that, that the, the message of, of Paul at midnight when it's dark and no man can work, having a supernatural event, and the power of God being shaken the place and their chains falling off and prison doors being open and people being saved. But I'm telling you right now, there is coming a great persecution. And when God's people are going to have to be ready for the, th for the days that are ahead. And there was, there was, there was in Jesus' example, was there was people who never stepped in the anointing. And they did not have what it took to make it through the night. And people should take it as a warning. There's a lot of people. I scream. Other people are screaming. Preacher hollers. But holler. No, Dr. Marco has the biggest, largest churches in the islands. He said to me, he said, he said, Mark, I want you to come over and scream and holler at my people. And that's good. I come scream and holler at people because people need to be screaming and hollering at. There's a day coming. You better get yourself some oil. You better wise up. You better get yourself. You better find your relationship with the Lord so deep, so steadfast, so beautiful, so wonderful that you kept by the power of God because there's a night coming. That unless you have that kind of relationship, unless you have that kind of walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't make it through the night. You won't make it. You won't make it. Those are the more important things for us to deal with. But so the sequence of events are as well. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus says again, Matthew, shall the sun be darkened? In other words, it shall give no light. These aren't, this isn't a blood moon. This isn't the moon shall be turned to blood. That happens at the beginning. This is no moon shining. The sun shall be dark and the moon shall give no light. And the stars from heaven shall fall and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Joel, Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord. We see that at the beginning of the tribulation under the seven seals. And that ain't happening. So we know the tribulation hasn't begun. So when somebody tells you the tribulation begun, say, where did I miss it? When did the sun no, give, did not give any light and the moon turned to blood? 
That's the only, I'm going to emphasize, this is the only moon sign and heavenly sign that we have in the scripture to be looking for that gives any warning or any prediction of any event and to tell us where we are at in the place and dealing in time and in the dealings of God with men. Are you with me? Yes. Don't believe the rest. If it's in the word, believe it. If it's not in the word, just don't believe it. Is that any simple enough? Okay, I just got to emphasize this to you. I'm responsible for you. Isaiah 13, 10. For the stars of heaven, and this is Isaiah. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. Boy, that really does help us to understand the stars aren't shining either. Right? This does really break it down. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. We see where this is, we know where this is going to happen. It's going to happen at the end of the tribulation, just before Jesus comes. You know he's about to break, the, uh, uh, break open from, from the unseen realm with a great host of his army. As soon as, all of a sudden, everything is black, dark. No sun, no moon. So it's got to be at least 24 hours. A sign that lasts at least 24 hours. No sun, no moon, no constellation, no star shining. Totally black. You can't miss that one. And there's not a cloud in the sky. You can't miss that one. Now, I'm happy to hear anybody telling me about that on TV and all this other preaching, but the rest of the stuff is a bunch of nonsense. Huh? Give me a break. It's a distraction. And listen to what the Lord says. Here's why it's going to happen. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease. I'm not going to look anything like that. Don't you tell me that God isn't upset with that iniquity because that's why he's doing this stuff. And I'm not going to have any of these things evil. I'm not going to have iniquity. I'm not going to have wickedness. I'm not going to have arrogance. And I'm not going to have pride. I'm not having any of that. Papa's not in it. Hallelujah. He's against it. Amen. And then we can go on. And I'm going to go on with these other verses of Scripture because it's when I give you... When I talk to you about things in the book of Revelation, I want to show you all the other verses of Scripture where the prophets have also said the same thing. I want you to hear it so, so loud and clear. Isaiah 34, 4. And the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Wow. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. When does it say that? That's under the fifth seal. That's right at the beginning of the tribulation. Do you see that? Are you with me? Come on, people. We're talking about an entirely different spiritual dimension and geographical dimension and social dimension that goes far beyond anything that you and I can relate to right now. And their host shall, and, and their host shall fall down, and, which is middle of tribulation, and, the leaf, uh, uh, and, their, and, and as a leaf falleth from the vine and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Because Satan will be cast out of the unseen. See, he has high places. He's in high places in a, in a place called the heavenly realm. It literally is a synonym for the unseen realm. It's the unseen. He comes from the unseen realm into the visible realm and begins to interact with men, him and his host. Middle of the tribulation. Not going to be a good time. For the windows, Isaiah 24, 18. For the windows from on high are open and the fountains of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth has moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgressors thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on, that, that are on high. Now you can understand this actually to be at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. Okay? But, and, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, how to sort those things out. Now, real quickly, the sea and the rivers will be dried up. I want you to see that, Jeremiah 51, 36. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance for thee, and, and I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Water, is gonna, the, the water in many places of the earth is not going to be available. You talk about amazing, unprecedented famine. When rivers start drying up, when springs start drying up, and when seas start drying up, we're in some serious trouble. Now, 
Nahum, verse, Nahum chapter 1, verse 4, he rebukes the sea and he makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan languishes. Carmel and the flower. Can you fix that? Is there any way you can do that? Of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him. And the hills melt. And the earth is burned at his presence. Revelation 16, 18. I'm going to finish with this one. And, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and, uh, and others was, and, and, forgive me, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. And we've already seen a bunch of earthquakes. We saw one great earthquake right there at the beginning of the seven seals. But this is the, this in Revelation chapter 16 is under the bold judgments. Okay? This is an earthquake like there's been no other earthquake. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities and the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her uh, the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So, at the end of every month on Friday, by the help and the grace of the Lord, we're going to go at this thing. Now, I'm going to try to make up for some lost time. So what I'm going to do is two weeks from tonight, I'm going to do another Revelation study. And the reason being, if I just do this once a month, um, it's going to take me a long time to get through it as it is. And seeing as if I, I've missed a month, I want, to make it, I want to make up for some lost time. So two weeks from tonight, we we'll do another Revelation study.